Hi, John. Okay. Hi, Ankit. So welcome to the first tech talk uh, powered by maps.io. Uh, before we dive deeper into the carbon fiber ecosystem and manufacturing, uh, maybe we can start off with uh, you know, your introduction about uh, yourself and your company, John. Okay, I will. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is John Davidson. I'm the president of Carbon Fiber Technologies International. Um, it's a, a consulting company which effectively uh, helps newcomers into the carbon fiber industry get started. I myself have been in the industry for 40 years, um, exactly this year, um, starting out uh, in 1982, working on uh, some early textile tow precursors for Courtauld's working with uh, what was then RK Carbon Fibers and is now SGL for a period of time. Um, then I developed uh, a, a carbon fiber composite recycling company uh, called Mill Carbon, which was eventually uh, purchased by ELG um, Carbon. Um, and beyond that, I've been working now as a freelance consultant for a period of time. Um, as I said earlier, aiding uh, newcomers uh, into the industry and also doing troubleshooting for uh, for lines that have perhaps stalled. Super. So okay. in your 40 years of experience, I mean, how many carbon fiber lines have you helped commission troubleshoot? And which Over part 30. of the world have you yeah. been? <laughs> awesome. uh, yeah, uh, Over 30, really. Um, um, and all over the world, I've been involved in, in the States, in Europe, um, in the Middle East, um, uh, China, especially uh, of late, and okay. more recently in, in, in India. Very interesting. Super. Uh, I think it will be a good time to delve maybe deeper into, you know, the actual carbon fiber. Uh, you know, maybe we can start off with a little bit of history of carbon fiber. and. Sure then move deeper into the whole process of manufacturing. Certainly, certainly. So uh, a, a brief history of your life, if you like. Um, it, effectively, the, uh, it, it all started with uh, uh, Joseph Swan uh, in the uh, late 1800s, uh, slightly before Edison, um, uh, who was uh, playing around with materials for uh, light bulbs. It was Edison, of course, that really made the, uh, uh, the, the breakthrough in that respect. But it wasn't until the 50s that uh, Roger Bacon at um, uh, uh, Union Carbide um, discovered uh, that uh, uh, graphite or graphite slivers had phenomenal properties uh, in terms of strength and, and modulus, strength and stiffness. Um, uh, but unfortunately, of course, they, these, these uh, uh, crystals were too short, too too small to do anything with. Um, but it, if you like, it it uh, pushed the research forward. Uh, and it wasn't until later in the sixties that uh, uh, Shindo um, devised a, a method for uh, polarization of of, of uh, a pan to to achieve pan or polyacrylonitrile, which is the precursor to make carbon fiber. Right. And of course, uh, at the same time. Um, uh, the Royal Aircraft Establishment in the UK was was working on uh, improving the properties of that pan that was uh, initially devised uh, uh, by Shindo. Um, and in the UK, certainly anyway, there were three licenses approved at the time um, for uh, to go into manufacturing. Um, uh, Morganite had one, uh, but decided not to proceed. Rolls-Royce had one. Excuse me. But of course, um, their foray into the use of carbon composites in uh, uh, turbine blades on their engines, uh, I'm afraid, doomed them to failure. Um, the, the, the blades broke, and of course, it nearly pretty much uh, bankrupted the company. And the, the final license was granted to Courtauld's. Uh, Courtauld's have had a, a very, very long history in terms of textiles and textile processing. So um, they were able to. Uh, really push forward um, and uh, prove the principles and begin making carbon fiber. Um, and of course, uh, Cortals 
didn't succeed. Not, not they didn't succeed with the carbon fiber. It was just that their business model didn't work, and they eventually ended up selling the business, uh, which is now known as Graphil, um, which is owned by Mitsubishi. So um, that left, certainly as far as the UK is concerned, it left only one manufacturing company, a company called RK Carbon Fibers, which was acquired by SGL in 1997. And uh, that's where my, my uh, involvement with SGL began, um, uh, leaving there in 2003 to get into the recycling. But the, 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 the principle that these, these guys went through, uh, James Watt, uh, 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 the Royal Aircraft Establishment, was, was how to process that, that pan precursor, that polyacrylonitrile precursor that was, that was developed by Shindo. And um, this is where, to all intents and purposes, um, the whole story begins now as it is in, in modern day. And um, there is a, a saying in the industry um, that 80% of a good carbon fiber is the precursor. Um, and it is extremely true. So it, it's, it's been one of those situations where uh, improvements in the precursor manufacturing process have only led to improvements in the carbon fiber properties uh, and uh, thus into the composites at, at end of use. But the industry really didn't begin to kick off properly until around the late 70s, 79 or so, uh, just a few years before I started my journey. Um, and of course, the, the early markets were quite simply uh, sporting goods, um, tennis rackets. Uh, uh, fishing rods and such like, and or uh, high-end military or space applications, and it's it it stayed that way for quite a while. Um, and the industry itself suffered a great deal from uh, uh, boom and bust. Every two or three years, the 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 bottom fell out of the market. Uh, the Japanese manufacturers flooded the market with uh, cheap carbon fiber, which other companies could not. Um, compete with, and consequently, uh, many of them went to, went to, into bankruptcy or were, were gobbled up by larger companies. So the effect that today, um, well, for many years, we only had about 12 manufacturers in the world, but today, with China uh, uh, gathering pace uh, behind, um, we're probably in the region of 14 to 15 manufacturers in the world today. And more coming um, up. Soon enough, and more coming up. Yes, so more coming up. There is uh, already there's uh, more projects going on in China. There's now projects uh, going on in India. Uh, there's projects going on in Saudi Arabia. So it's it's really uh, building up now. So what's and driving the? Of, yeah, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say the 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 reason why this is happening. The, the reason why suddenly the market's taken a boost because for a while, between about 2011 and 2013, 14, the market was a bit flat. Um, not much, not a great deal was happening. And, and suddenly we've really picked up these past few years. And um, predominantly it's the wind power requirements. Um, so the, the turbine blades uh, over hundred meters long generally have to be in carbon fiber for the, for the weight saving. Um, and consequently that's, that's really pushing the industry in terms of, uh, of production. Um, but also the, um, the recent hydrogen uh, uh, interest. Uh, so the hydrogen uh, fuel tanks um, are going so to be these, made out of carbon So fiber. you're talking about the green, uh, uh, the green hydrogen, these are the composite cylinders you're talking about. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's effectively, it's it's H two for transport, uh, mm. whatever kind, and not not just transport, but that's generally the right. uh, the the push now these days. So, um, uh, just going back, the, I mean, I'll come back to green hydrogen uh, cylinders, but sure, in sure. the you also mentioned the wind, uh, uh, the wind wind windmill blades. Uh, who, I mean, yeah. are there many manufacturers for carbon fiber windmill blades, or there? I mean. Uh, the, the market has been there are specific few uh, well known the G, um, uh, Siemens Gamesa, um, uh, a, a couple of the big names, 
There's not many. There's uh, Fiber Force in uh, Denmark. Um, and of course, there are uh, Chinese manufacturers as well. Okay. Um, and there are, there are many more. Um, and it's this, it's this move now, this recent move into the longer plates that is really pushing uh, for uh, more carbon fiber capacity. Interesting. And the problem is, of course, it, it takes a long time to get a carbon fiber line into production. Right. Um, so the, the move is afoot now to try and meet the, the, the anticipated um, uh, market in the, in the coming years. And you <clears throat> mentioned green hydrogen. I mean, that's really upcoming, like all over the world. Now, okay. the, now the world is moving towards green hydrogen. So you foresee the next market is towards composite cylinders. So every, com yeah. every vehicle um, is going to have a, a cylindrical hydrogen cylinder based out of, made out of carbon fiber. You believe? It, it, well, in fact, not that well. Don't forget batteries, of course, and, and okay. battery casings are being made out of carbon fiber as well. Oh, really? Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, the, 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 the issue is, of course, is that batteries are not that green. Uh, it, it, certainly in their manufacture and not, and not so much in their disposal either. Um, so whilst they give us a green car, per se, where we're not, uh, there are no emissions while we drive around, uh, the end of life of that particular piece of equipment is, is not, as yet, uh, not as clear as, as perhaps it ought to be. Mm. And, and hydrogen, of course, um, is, 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 is more akin to the way we use cars today in terms of uh, uh, you, you go to a petrol station, you fill it with fuel and you carry on on your journey. Right. And, and so the same would be with, with, with hydrogen, uh, a similar sort of um, uh, process of use. So th there is a, a strong push for, for hydrogen, especially in uh, uh, transporting trucks, um, right. because it's, it's easier to get a, a number of cylinders on there as part of a, a, a truck than, than perhaps it, there's something in a car has to give up the space for the cylinder. Right, right, so right. you always have these problems. I remember in China, they used uh, compressed natural gas in their taxis. Right, the same here in India. Get your yeah, you can't get your suitcase in a boot, so yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. There, are, but there are pluses I think, and minuses. Uh, I think uh, electric, uh, electric batteries and green hydrogen, that's another whole discussion topic that I think we should come back to. Oh, yes. Uh, but before we yeah, digress, yeah. let's come back to carbon fibers. Yeah. Yes, sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so the um, carbon so, fiber yeah, value uh, chain starts at uh, acronitrile and then polyacronitrile, which gets, which becomes carbon fiber, and then which further becomes fabric or pre prepegs, and then it becomes composites. I mean, that's the uh, whole value. That's effectively, yeah. Yes, it's, uh, uh, it comes from uh, uh, propene, um, and it's mixed with ammonia, and you get uh, acrylonitrile. And acrylonitrile makes up about 95% of uh, pan precursor. The rest being some other monomers and co-monomers, um, some um, uh, other small amounts of, of chemicals. But the unfortunate thing is, of course, it, it is all uh, fossil fuel based. And there are now moves afoot to uh, develop bio-based uh, acrylonitrile, <clears throat> which, which uh, um, is, is apparently is going to, going to go into scaled up production soon. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see how that fares in terms of the production of PAN. Um, granted, there are some monomers and co-monomers that are still fossil fuel based, but of course, if you imagine that 95% of PAN is made up of the acrylonitrile, if that's bio-based, then that's a step forward. It's not the complete step, but it's a big step. Okay. So um, the, the idea really is, is that the, the carbon fiber has, has been growing uh, in, a, in a fairly steady, steady state uh, since 2001, strangely enough, since that terrible period of time in 2001, um, where all, the av all aviation was grounded for a particular reason. And frankly, the industry half expected the whole thing to go flat altogether, but in fact, no. Since then, we've had steady growth, uh, probably nine, 10% per year, since then, apart from the the, 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 the blips of the uh, financial hiatus in 2008 and 9, 
And of course, the recent pandemic has, has kind of flattened a few things. But having said that, um, it is the industry really, really busy now. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's improving. And the idea being is, of course, the, the, currently the, the, the considered capacity of the whole industry, and, and carbon fiber is an extremely small industry as far as materials goes. We're minuscule compared to the likes of, of concrete and steel. Um, and we, we only have about 165,000 tons of capacity in the world. Uh, and, and the unfortunate thing is, is it, it's only a guesstimation because, frankly, everybody uh, doesn't tell you exactly what their capacity is. And there are differences uh, in terms of how you interpret a capacity. Okay. So nominally 165,000 tonnes. Now, just as an example, the wind blade manufacturers, just one wind blade manufacturer is predicting a need for 150,000 tonnes a year in 2025. Wow. Now that's over... That's over, that's over and above what we already make, what we already can make, which is, like I say, normally 165,000 tonnes. The trouble is, of course, um, it takes so long to get these production lines online and providing the material that's required. So you're saying so, one single windmill braid manufacturer needs 140 metric tons annually? It's, it, it, yeah. It, they, by 2025. Uh, yeah, Fiber Force in uh, Denmark at a recent Go Carbon uh, conference, uh, predicted that their need uh, for the market would be 150,000 tons. Wow. And that's just one single sub buyer. And then you'd have all these yeah. different other applications, which, I mean, yeah, uh, composite well, cylinder is just one of them, and aerospace and uh, Formula One racing uh, cars, exactly. golf, golf, all of those other yes. applications. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. I think that's uh, a good industry well, to be in. Marine. Yeah, marine, yachts. Yeah, oil and gas are, are getting into it as well, oil and gas. So there's, it's, the, the only, the, the problem with, at the moment with, with carbon fiber is it's expensive. Um, it's expensive to make. Uh, it's not terribly green to make either. Uh, but again, moves our foot in the industry to try and uh, uh, improve our CO2 footprint. Um, but, this is why really car manufacturers have never really taken carbon fiber on in, in the mass market. Um, yes, in the specialized vehicles such as Lamborghini and, uh, and of course BMW. Um, but because uh, the manufacturing method for composites is a bit labor intensive and it's, it's, there are making great strides in terms of automation. But there are still elements there that it, it takes time to make a, a, a composite part. And of course, the, the car people are, are just used to stamping things out of metal in, in less than a minute. Uh, and that's the sort of process, that, that the uh, manufacturing process, that they want to maintain in, in making a car to make it uh, profitable for them. So if you like, they, we're stuck at the moment because the, the steel industry would like... Uh, uh, the carbon fiber to, to match their, their price, the price for steel, uh, whereas unfortunately it's not going to do that, not for a good while yet anyway. Um, so there's reluctance by the automakers, auto, automakers to, to, to get into carbon in any, any big way. Um, and the other issue, of course, it's never been addressed in, in, in this discussions about um, uh, carbon in auto, auto, automobiles, is, is how do we repair them? Um, generally, well, you all, we all know about a, a Formula One, and if we see a crash, yes, granted, these crashes are at high speed, um, but nevertheless, damage occurs. So it's a, it's a question in, in many respects, because these are shaped parts or molded parts, um, having uh, repairing these things is it's a little more problematic than a standard motor car that you see on the road these days. Makes sense. Um, so it's one of these situations. It's what, garages would not be equipped to repair a composite part. So how how does that work? You know, your right. insurance company is going to have to go to a, a particular company to to have that repair effective. Um, Got it. And that's that infrastructure is not there, uh, and it would take a while for it to get there. So. There's that reluctance just at the moment. But nevertheless, um, 
they're still moving forward. BMW is still using carbon fiber, not but not the same as the i3 and the i8. Um, but it moves apace. Okay. And the, the, the try, everybody's trying different ways of making of using carbon fiber. You use you get carbon fiber on your Dell computers. Um, in fact, you probably get recycled carbon fiber on your Dell computers these days. And so the, that 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 push is, is always there because somebody's always coming up with a way of making use of carbon fiber. And it has a number of properties, of course, uh, let alone from its strength and, and stiffness. Um, so it, it's 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 still something that's growing. It's a growing industry. We're still learning in many respects. And the range of, uh, of, of carbon fibers that you get are have almost become, whilst the industry doesn't have any standards per se, no, no acknowledged and accepted standards, we tend to use, uh, unfortunately, the Torre nomenclature when we speak about uh, the properties of carbon fibre, so the T300, T700, T800 type thing. Right. But everybody, everybody has their own, everyone has their own nomenclature. Right. But if you like, the, the, the Torre T system is, is, is the unofficial standard that everybody talks right. of when, when they're describing the properties. Um, so what's this, the difference like, between a T300 to a T800 or 700? What's the difference? Uh, it, it, it's simply the strength of modules. Okay. So um, uh, we talk in terms, when, when, I was, when I was early in this industry, it, it, the strength was in GPA or gigapascals. Right. And the modulus was, was in megapascals. Now that's turned on its head now, and, st and strength is, is in uh, megapascals and modulus in gigapascals. But I, I still speak in the old ways. So uh, a T300 is, is 3.59 gigapascals strength and nominally 230 modulus. Okay. Uh, a T700 is, is 4.9 uh, with possibly 230 to 250. And, and, and this is the interesting part about carbon fiber. You can, to some degree in the processing, um, affect the, the, the properties of the carbon fiber. So you can get a, a, a variation on those themes within, they're just yeah. one spot on, on a graph, if you like, because mm -hmm. there are a variation of themes in terms of the strength and modulus that you can impart to your material when during its processing. And if, if you go back, if you like, if we take it this back now to the actual manufacturing of Precursor, um, and this is where, if you like, we, we really do uh, help ourselves in terms of um, how that carbon fibre converts into the properties we, we require. So first stage is, of course, of making uh, Precursor is that acrylonitrile and the other monomers and co-monomers are uh, put into a reactor and, and polymerized. Uh, it's a bit like making bread, if you like, bringing all your ingredients together and mixing them together. And uh, the outcome is, is something that's called dope, D-O-P-E. And this dope has the look and consistency of honey. <coughs> Excuse me. And the that that dope, the, the way then it is is, is progressed through the system, uh, is placing a really important part in the in the quality of the carbon fiber that we get, not the quality of the precursor, which leads to the quality of the carbon fiber. And um, that dope, if you like, is a, is is treated in in different ways depending on the polymerization process, but ostensibly um, that dope, that honey-like mixture. Is, is mixed with a solvent. And there are about, I think there's about five solvents that, that are currently in use. Uh, DMSO, which is uh, the favored one because it's a little more environmentally friendly, but not necessarily as easy to use. Uh, DMAC, which is um, maybe being considered as not friendly, but um, fairly easy to, to, to live with. Uh, sodium thiocyanate, which is uh, a reasonably easy one. Um, DMF, uh, which is the easiest uh, solvent to work with, but unfortunately is the nastiest and is, is if not banned, will be banned. Okay. And then there's uh, zinc chloride. Uh, and the only problem with zinc chloride, of course, is it attacks all your steel work. Um, so 
the, that material is then mixed with that solvent and extruded into a spinning line. So it, that, that dope-like material, that, that honey-like material becomes a fibrous material in that spinning process. And in that spinning process, again, attention to quality is really paramount, uh, making sure that um, uh, uh, there are no broken filaments in the, in, the, in the manufacturing process where possible, it's not always easy. Um, and that then, that, that, uh, that precursor is then uh, sent down this very long spinning line and washed, stretched, steam stretched, uh, collapsed, uh, stretched again, and uh, and finally has a, a spin finish put on it to then be collected on big winders uh, to give us a bobbin a pan precursor. Um, and it's just a, it's a, a big bobbin. About. Usually the, the common standard today is 350 kilograms, but uh, we're, we're looking for bigger ones where possible. 500 kilograms is, is being talked of. Um, and that, that bobbin, those selection of bobbins as, as the spinning line produces them, is then transferred to the carbon fiber line uh, and uh, put onto the creel of the carbon fiber line and, and fed through the, the, the carbon line uh, to the end. Yeah, I have uh, a question here. Uh, there are several spinning processes as well, uh, right? If I'm not, mm -hmm. before we go into carbon fiber, uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Could yeah. you this, also e yeah. explain the spinning process? I yeah. think there is air gap, uh, wet spinning. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, predominantly, uh, it, wet spinning is is the is the method, which is to all intents and purposes the the spinneret through which the dope is introduced onto the spinning line is submerged into what's called the coagulation bath or spin bath. Okay, that is stand, standard wet spinning, and that that method tends to have a limit in terms of. Uh, um, what, what properties you can uh, acquire from, from your precursor, Al although people are making great strides in, in this process all the time and improving things. Um, the second one is um, air gap spinning. And it is, to all intents and purposes, it's exactly the same uh, spinning line, but where the uh, spinneret is submerged in the spin bath, this time the spinneret is above the spin bath at a pre-prescribed gap above the spin bath. And this is why it's called air gap spinning. Um, and the, the principle being that that little bit of gap allows stretch, reduces the diameter of the uh, filament, which adds to your properties when you make carbon fiber. Now, the only problem with air gap spinning is it is somewhat constrained to the small toe counts. Um, when we make carbon fiber, we, make, we call it a toe, uh, and it's generally made up of a bundle of fibers or filaments, should I say. Uh, we talk in terms of, of K, 1K, 3K, 6K, and that's, that, that determines the amount of filaments within that, that bundle of fibers, that toe. So all the way up to 320K, 480K, even 610K uh, in, in certain circumstances. So, um, that, so if I'm not wrong, the but, smaller filament count is more geared towards aerospace applications, whereas the it. bigger toe yeah. count is more geared towards commercial applications. More in, in industrial, that's right. Right, right. industrial. So they, they may, you, yeah, you, you're generally constrained to three, six, and 12, uh, and sometimes just three and six, and companies just make multiples of, of toes to get up the higher counts. So, you know, if they want a 24K, off, a, off a, an air gap line, they just pull uh, four sixes together, four six Ks together or something like that. And they air intermingle that and make, to make a tone. Um, there are other methods out there. There's, uh, there's melt spinning of pan, which is it's really only at research level at this moment in time. It's not, not, not made too many great strides, but it is, that's, that's of interest because it does uh, take away a lot of the uh, uh, not just the equipment, but the, the 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 bad environmental issues that we have with with making a uh, pan precursor. Um, but it's it's not mature enough. The, the, there have been uh, some research uh, uh, benefits 
but nothing yet as far as scale up is concerned. So right now we're stuck with um, wet spinning or uh, air gap spinning. Um, and depending on what the end use is, the companies will have both lines, uh, depending on what, what their customers require. So um, that precursor, um, depending on how well it's made, uh, the, the recipe it's made with, how well it's handled down the line, the, the spinning line, the, the quality assurances as, as at every stage, and get, giving us a good precursor for the carbon fiber line is, is paramount. Because what we're going to do to that precursor next, if there are any faults in that precursor, they are shown up quite dramatically on a carbon fiber line. Okay. So um, we have our pan bobbins and they are now on our uh, creel, as it's called. It's just simply an unwind uh, station. And depending on the size of the line, uh, the common standard at the moment is three meters wide. There are some wider, some smaller. Um, and depending on the toe count will depend on how much how much material you can get through that line. When we say three meters wide, that's the width of the toe band. So that's the width of the multiple of toes that we can get in that space. So um, we spoke so about polym we spoke about polymerization. That's where we make the toe. Mm. After polymerization came the spinning line. That's where we made this white fiber called precursor. And now yeah, this precursor bobbins are brought to a carbon fiber line. So you can have a separate plant mm for precursor and a separate plant for carbon fibers? Yes. The ideal situation is that they are in very close proximity to each other. Okay. Um, that's, the, that's the ideal situation. Not, it doesn't always happen um, because most of the manufacturers, uh, carbon fiber manufacturers, have precursor manufacturing capability as well. They keep it in-house. Uh, it's a way of making sure uh, that they don't have too much competition because... Okay. Acquiring pan is, is quite difficult on the market at the moment. There's only one company, and that's a Chinese company. Okay. Uh, um, so it's, it's that's why uh, it, it's, it's generally yes. If you do have a pan line and a carbon line together, that's perfect. That's the perfect scenario, uh, and ideally they are in close proximity to each other because the feedback is good. You know, if we're having a problem on the carbon fiber line, we can tell the, the spinning guys. They can see if there's been problems on their line. So. It, it, it works very well that way. So now you um, bring the 300 uh, dia, 300 50, kgs or dia? 300, 350 kilograms. Kilograms uh, of bobbins uh, to yeah. the carbon fiber line now. Okay. That's correct, yeah. And, and we, we, I was just saying about the fact that the, the standard uh, at the moment is, is three meter wide uh, line. Uh, and that simply um, uh, relates to the width of the toe band as it passes through the oven. So the equipment itself is much wider than that. But where the tow path of, of, the, of the system is three meters wide. So three and meter would correlate counts, to how much in production quantity? Um, it's a not what we call a nameplate of 1500 tons. And generally the industry tends to uh, 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 quote quote these these uh, capacities around 12k so that's uh, it's always it's been a standard as, as we've gone along in, in, in the years um, when a proposal is, is, is made this is always uh, uh, predicated around the use of 12k um, so, so three meter line equates to 1500 metric ton per year for 12k toes yes for 12k and there's usually it depends. 470 toes uh, in that width. That's a lot of, uh, of carbon fiber in there. Um, now, obviously, most carbon fibers can pretty much produce any toe count, um, although 1K really should be done on its own small separate line, uh, even 3K for that matter. But ostensibly, any carbon fiber line worth its salt will be able to produce any toe count. Now, in some cases, because of the higher toe counts, so 320K and above, uh, a different method of, uh, of uh, uh, introducing that material to uh, the line uh, and collecting it is required. So it's, there, there, are, there are quite different uh, scenarios involved, but generally uh, a line is usually predicated around 12K, 
but it can do 6K, it can do 24K, it can do 48K and higher if the design is there in the beginning. Um, and so and the production nameplate would change accordingly. Yes, uh, and uh, you get, you imagine you've got 470, 24K, uh, 12K, you get roughly or in the order of half of that uh, for 24K, as you might imagine, right. you're going right. up in size. And similarly, again, half again, if you go to 48. 48, yeah. But the interesting, yeah, but the interesting part of this is that you get a higher yield for this, for, for the nominal same throughput. It's simply the fact that the toes are much bigger uh, and, and the yield is, is somewhat higher. So uh, at 24K, that 1,500 tons could, could very nearly become 1,600, depending on line speed, of course. Right. And uh, as far as far as 48K, well, you, you're nearing the 2,000 mark, um, again, dependent on uh, line speed. So there are there are pluses in being able to produce these these higher toe counts, uh, not not least in the fact that the composite users are pushing towards that that area now because it gives them more lay down when they make their composite parts. It takes them less time. They put more down quickly, and if the properties are good, it still does the same job. So um, there is there is great interest in uh, in going to these industrial sizes and trying to drag the airspace more towards these industrial sizes. Okay. Um, but this it's it's a slow slow process. Um, right. So we, we take our material, our PAM precursor, and we uh, deliver it to our, the first stage in this process, which is oxidation, commonly known as oxidation. Uh, but in, in effect, it's, it's uh, also known as uh, stabilization and cyclization. So there are, we, we present the fiber to these very large uh, ovens that are air heated recirculation ovens. And, and quite literally, the, the fiber passes through these ovens backwards and forwards across what we call passback rollers. And they go through certain zones of temperature uh, onto the next oven. Again, same principle. Again, higher zones of temperature. And it's the same again. And commonly, there are three ovens in a, in a carbon fiber line. Sometimes there are two. In other cases, there have been more. Um, but commonly, three. And you're talking about uh, anywhere between 60 to 120 minutes to process this material into what is called OPF, oxidized pan fiber. Now, what we're aiming to do here, what we're trying to do with this oxidation process is to reach a, a fiber density that allows us to move to the next step, which is carbonization. Now, if we don't reach that density uh, and we progress too quickly, into the furnaces that are the next step. Um, the danger is, is that we will either completely lose the material in the, uh, in the, in the LT furnace, or the properties will be so bad as, as to make the, the, the carbon fiber, the resultant carbon fiber of no use. So it's very, we have to be very, very careful with this first step in terms of making sure that we don't suffer from uh, what we call uh, skin core, which is, I, I like to use the analogy of, you take a frozen turkey out of the, your freezer, you put it straight in your oven and cook it for two hours. Yes, the outside is cooked, but the inside is still frozen. Well, it's the same principle, that's what skin core is. What we're trying to do is get oxygen into the center of each of those filaments in that whole process that can take 60 to 120 minutes we're trying to make sure that they are all cooked internally as far as possible. They don't always get every one of them. But that's the principle. We're just trying to cook the inside. I and mean, if we go too fast, there's a danger of we're going to leave some uh, uncooked material in the middle. If we go too, too slow, well, we, we don't want to be slow because that, that reduces our capacity, that reduces, that increases the energy requirement for the time it takes to do that. Um, and also, we can damage the fiber by that our density will be way too high, uh, and we, we're in danger of, of damaging the fiber. So, it is a bit of a balancing act in all aspects, not just the fiber that's going through these hot ovens. And we're talking about anywhere from two, 220 up to maybe 260, 270. Each manufacturer has their own recipe for these things. 
Uh, and again, it's obviously centered around the precursor that they're using. Um, so this, this uh, oxidation process is, I often say, there is as much art as there is science in making carbon fiber. And the, the art comes in with the guys who are running these lines, the operators. They understand the process. Uh, they, they see the difficulties there. They, they have solutions for those difficulties. <clears throat> they understand what's happening and how to deal with the line. And it's, it's that interaction, if you like, that enables us to have a steady state line with good properties at the end of the day. Um, and the, 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 the biggest danger we have in, in the oxidation section is, well, the worst case scenario is what we call a gas explosion. Uh, where um, the predominant waste gas that was generated in the system is uh, hydrogen cyanide. Uh, and if that's not removed properly from the, from the line, um, it builds up inside the ovens and they, we can get a... Uh, a, a Fire or explosion. It, uh, the worst case explosion, the next best is a fire, which is, which is never, never yeah. welcome. But nevertheless, yeah. it's easier to deal with. We understand how to deal with those. Um, and then, of course, the, there is the, the other uh, uh, contingent, which is that we could possibly have a, a, a fiber fire where the fiber is caught fire uh, for, for many different reasons. Um, and of course, we have protocols for dealing with, with fires. Ovens come these days with uh, um, deluge systems on them to contain the fires. <clears throat> um, and we have uh, uh, working practices that, that know how to deal with, with these fires and stay safe at the same time. So um, again, these, these are things that we've worked on years for years. So we now have our uh, OPF at the density that we're looking for, which is usually about 1.36 to 1.37, somewhere around there, usually. And, and again, there are many variations. Um, we then introduce that OPF into the first of the two carbonization furnaces. Sometimes uh, people have three, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so this LT furnace, the low temperature furnace, which is a, uh, um, an alloy muffle uh, with an inert atmosphere, uh, nitrogen usually, uh, and we're using what we call five nines nitrogen, so high purity. Um, our material travels into this furnace and um, we instantly lose up to 50% of its weight. And that comes off as, as a, a waste gas, which is then removed to the, to the waste gas system, which also treats the waste gas from the oxidation system and from the furnace system in two distinct stages, an RTO or regenerative thermal oxidizer for the waste gas treatment, uh, for the uh, oxidation gases, and a, a DFTO or direct fired thermal oxidizer for uh, the carbonization gases. And, and there is a, a reason for this, which I'll, I'll go into in a minute. Uh, and in some cases, uh, some companies have what we call a UHT furnace or ultra high temperature furnace uh, for those who wish to push the modulus uh, of the fiber. And, and this usually goes up to 2,600 or 3,000 degrees C, depending. Whereas our LT furnace basically is um, uh, anywhere from 400 up to 950 degrees C. Um, and, and again, everybody has a variation on their own theme in terms of the running of the fiber. And it, again, it depends on the toe count as well. And these are multi-zoned, quite long furnaces in some cases um, uh, with discrete zones, uh, six, seven, eight, even nine, uh, with that range of temperatures that are, are set for the, the, the parameters for a particular recipe of, 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 of a particular carbon fiber that is to be made. That material then, remember it's now we've lost, we've lost pretty much lost half our weight. So our, our yield from pan to carbon is about two to one. Okay. So two, two, kilos of, two kilos of pan to one kilo of carbon, thereabouts. Then we go into our next furnace, our HT furnace or high temperature furnace. Um, and in here, this is a complete graphite furnace um, because of the temperatures we're dealing with. So we, we have anywhere from 1000 degrees C up to 1800 degrees C. Um, most 
it's very common to get a, a 1600, which is a standard size, uh, standard uh, HT furnace. But in some cases, again, when customers want to push their modulus, which they can do, uh, they'd like to go for an 1800 degrees C furnace. So again, this is the customer's uh, choice at the beginning. Um, and the, again, we have a five nines uh, in a, inert atmosphere. Five nines nitrogen in Earth's atmosphere in, in the furnace, and, and to some degree, the the art that, that we've had to uh, work on the oxidation with also comes into use on the uh, uh, the furnaces themselves because it is a balancing act. This whole process is a balancing act. In oxidation, we're living on the edge of exotherm all the time, so we have to remove that heat from that oven, and we have to set everything up. To, to facilitate that, to make sure that that remains the case. And so the same goes for the furnaces, because remember, these are open-ended furnaces. Right. The fibers going in at one end and coming out the other, right. usually nominally, nominally 10 meters a minute, but sometimes up to 15 meters a minute, which is slow for textile, really quite slow. But nevertheless, it's still a balancing act. And this is where the art again comes in. Now, in the old days, we used to have a, an incinerator, a simple incinerator right next to the furnace, and it was much easier to balance the furnace. We could just do that by the, the, the small change of a valve. But of course, as things get sophisticated and uh, improvements come along, um, the, the waste gas treatment system is now remote outside okay. the building. Um, and so consequently, we have long pipe runs and such like, and these themselves cause problems. Um, and, and this is where part of the art of, of keeping these furnaces running uh, in the fashion that we want them to be running um, really plays a part. So if, if you like, it's, it's quite funny really, because um, th this material being such a high tech, sexy material, you wouldn't believe how medieval, medieval it is, the, the way that we actually make this stuff. Um, it's quite, uh, by comparison, I mean, um, yeah. Um, much of the process has not changed in 40, 50 years. Okay. Uh, we, we're still making it the same way we made it when I first started out in, in early 82. So anyway, we, we come out of our HT furnace now. And the, the, the one thing with, with raw carbon fiber is a number of things. Uh, it has a very low coefficient of friction. Um, so it's slippy as hell. So we've got to... Um, kind of give the surface of the carbon fiber a wake up call because um, the inherent chemistry on the fiber that is still there is, if you like, dormant, it's gone to sleep. Um, so our next step is what we call surface treatment. And, there are, and this is simply, in the, in the most common cases, this is a, a dip tank with uh, ammonium bicarbonate solution in it uh, through which the fiber is passed it's passed over an anode roller and in between two cathodes or a number of cathodes, depending on, on, on the design. And uh, electricity is introduced, usually around seven volts at 200 amps. <clears throat> and what this does, it helps that, that, uh, that sleeping chemistry on the surface of the carbon fiber wake up. And the principle being is, <clears throat> I liken it to when you want to paint a wall at home you sand the the wall first so that yeah. the paint has something to to grip to to bind right. to. and this is right. the same principle with surface treatment so what we're doing is taking the chemicals that are on the uh, on the line on the on the uh, fiber such that the final matrix can, has got something to grip to so we, we get a good uh, bond between fiber and uh, right. resin so that's the principle of surface treatment and ammonium bicarb is the most, by far the most common. Um, you also get uh, a weak solution of uh, sulfuric acid is another method. Um, <clears throat> also ozone has been tried uh, in, in some cases. Uh, so and all sorts of weird and wonderful things have been done to try and right. improve the surface of, of, of the uh, carbon fiber. Um, so once it's been in the, the surface treatment bath, uh, which is, on, if, you have, if you have a bad head cold, it's one of the best places to go to get your head cleared, your sinus cleared. <laughs> um, um, 
we uh, we wash we wash that, that the carbon fiber now. This is resultant carbon fiber. Bear in mind, we still have our three meter wide tow band as we progress down the side. Okay, right. And um, the uh, we wash the the uh, the the salts off the fiber. Yeah. And then we do uh, we we dry the fiber thereafter, uh, usually on uh, uh, drum rollers, uh, heated rollers, um, and this we dry that so that the the obviously the the, the water on the fiber is, is removed as much as possible because our next step is to size the fiber and, and that is it's most commonly again it's a water-based epoxy size there are <clears throat> hundreds of variations of size mixes some are secret recipes some you can buy off the shelf depending on what your customer requires with regard to their final end use Okay. So this size in itself, this particular, the standard size, uh, has a look and consistency of milk, surprisingly enough. Uh, <clears throat> but it's very sticky, as you might imagine, because it's a resin, if you like, at the end of the day. And we put this size on for, for two reasons, one of which is, of course, the, uh, the resultant composite is, going to, is predominantly an epoxy uh, thermoset resin. Um, and that that epoxy size helps with the with the bonding again, but it also helps to uh, protect the toes as they are then processed further <coughs> beyond the end of the line. Um, from there, we dry again, and most commonly, well, I say most commonly <clears throat> in the early days, it always used to be drum rollers, uh, heated rollers. Um, but the unfortunate thing. In those days, I don't think the surface uh, was was extremely good of the of the rollers, and we had build up of resin onto these uh, hot right. rollers. And as you might imagine, because you're, you're to all intents and purposes, you're cu curing this resin exactly. onto the fiber, right? And it left it left residue on the rollers, which then predominantly damaged the fibers as they passed over again. Makes so sense. we did away with that, yeah, and we moved to what we call the non-contact dryer which is to all intents and purposes, it's a vertical clamshell dryer, uh, an air infringement dryer. So we come in at the bottom, up, cross the top and back down again. But the drying is done away from rollers. There are rollers at the bottom, and there are rollers right. at the top, but the drying is done in the middle. Okay. Uh, and, it, and, and this, uh, it works extremely well. And so we have our dried material, we, we then go through our final drive, our final drive system into collection. And, and collection is usually done with online winders where that carbon fiber is, is uh, uh, captured on cores, cardboard cores. Um, and depending on what the customer requires, it can be anywhere from two kilograms up to 15 kilograms or, or higher in some cases. Um, and then that material is removed from the line once, once it's reached its designated uh, length. Um, we go by length rather than weight in, in the settings of. Um, that, then, that is then removed from the line. And in certain circumstances, it's, uh, it's a manual packaging process. Uh, and the, the <coughs> bobbin is, is weighed, labels are put in, uh, plastic shrimp wrap is put round it through a shrink wrap oven and then boxed and uh, palleted ready for delivery. Uh, what's, what's predominantly now becoming the case is that that packaging process is now fully automated. Okay. So whilst there is still a, a guy on the, on the uh, creel who's still there removing these bobbins when they reach their length, their, their designated length, and uh, she tells them that, they remove that, put a new core on, start the bobbin off again. But that bobbin that they've taken off, they've put onto a, a, a bobbin trolley. And then once that's full, that is removed to the uh, packing area and that whole process is then from that bottom okay. is automated. Okay. So that's, the, that's the general principle. Now, <clears throat> that carbon fiber as it is, is what we simply term as vir virgin carbon fiber. Um, it's, uh, then has to go through a process of uh, conversion. So it's made into all sorts of different formats, depending on the end use. So yeah. predominantly- uh, Before we go into conversions, before we go into conversions, yeah. um, I'd, 
I want to pick your brains on one of the topics that you mentioned. You were going to come back again, which is the gas abatement systems. Oh you, yes, yes, sorry, yes. So sorry. before yeah. we miss that, let's talk about a little bit there, and then we go to conversions. Yeah. So let's. Thanks for reminding me about that. Okay, that's good. Yes, waste gas treatment. Um, as as of course, environmental controls have got stricter uh, over the years. Um, you can no longer, of course, just emit to atmosphere anymore, and so, therefore. <clears throat> every carbon fiber line has to have a waste gas treatment system and it can come in various shapes and forms and there are just a few manufacturers to the industry uh, that are uh, the ones of choice um, and the system basically is made up of, of, of as i mentioned a, an rto a regenerative thermal oxidizer and a dfto direct fired thermal oxidizer now we have the two dis distinctly different methods for, for a fairly simple reason and it's one of balance. In the oxidation section, we have a high volume of, of waste gas, but low combustibility. In the carbonized side, the furnaces side for the DFTO, we have a low volume, but high combustibility. Now, when it comes to balancing that line, it's extremely difficult to balance if you only have what tends to happen sometimes is you only have a DFTO. Uh, let's face it, carbon fiber line is expensive. And anywhere you can, people can save money, they will try and do that. Unfortunately, uh, when you try to balance a line with only one <clears throat> of the, the, the DFTO, it becomes very difficult to compete with the two volumes of flow from the, the two sections of the line. And, and this is why we always, always recommend that they must have an RTO and a DFTO, um, because otherwise it just makes your life hell. Now, so what does an RTO and again, do and what does a DFTO do? Well, an, an RTO is, is, is basically, um, it's, a, it's a fairly large object and the, it, it's heated to around 8, 820, 8, 850 degrees C. The, the, the waste gas comes in. <clears throat> It passes through a filter bed, which is usually made up of uh, ceramic, uh, either ceramic saddles or ceramic saddles and ceramic blocks, which have fine holes in them. And this is a way of, of filtering out uh, um, the, the gases um, and then burning uh, the resultant uh, gases. The only problem with this is, is, is one, one of the biggest problems we have in the industry um, is that the spin finish that is put on the precursor on the spinning line is silicon based. Now, depending on how much silicon there is in that spin finish, it can determine uh, the plague of our lives, which is silica. Uh, because as we get into the oxidation ovens, that silicon turns into silica. And if it's a lot, it comes off in the oven and not only can it block the oven up, but it actually blocks the RTO up and becomes a real problem. To the point now where, where some some manufacturers have two RTOs, uh, one one being used and one on standby. Um, so that's what the RTO does. But the DFTO works as a as a standard incinerator in many respects. So, um, and it's just, it's a multi staged uh, incinerator, and that helps to burn off the the really bad gases that come out of the LT furnace. Uh, mainly hydrocarbons and um, some HCN and so on. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, one of the things that we have improved on is recovered heat. Um, and of course, what we try to do and what we do do now as, as common practice is to take that recovered heat from that waste gas treatment system and reintroduce that recovered heat into the oxidation ovens. Uh, and an yeah. oxidation oven has to be has to be designed to take this heat. It can't be. It's one right. of these things. Oh, you can't just do it after the event. If I right, um, and that and that helps us to reduce our energy requirement for the ovens. So it's it's a real boon, and it's a, and it's a good use of of, of a wasted uh, right. opportunity. So um, can we also recover no gases, or can we also recover gases no. and silica? Uh, well, uh, no, really, no. Uh, because the, the silica we tend to just wash that off uh, <clears throat> it's it's a real problem and, and they are looking into uh, 
new spin finishes without silicon. But we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Okay. Um, somebody's talked about somebody talked about capturing HCN hmm. off the system, uh, but, but nobody's really been serious about trying to do that. Maybe somebody's researched it, but it's okay. never got anywhere on a full scale line. Um, and the hydrocarbons, <coughs> because uh, excuse me, because they are such a mix of, of chemicals in there. Uh, how are you going to separate them? It's, it, sometimes right. it's a case of live with what you've got because what you're proposing to do is possibly more costly and, and, and may, may cause other problems elsewhere. So right. it is where it is at the moment, but yeah. <clears throat> I, I have posed this question to some of the uh, waste gas uh, uh, system manufacturers about carbon capture. How do we, or can we, is it something that we can do that again, that would help to mitigate. Now, we, the, the line the line generally has to uh, adhere to uh, certainly uh, European um, um, environmental regulations, which are fairly strict, um, and that we use that um, that same uh, legislation to supply to all over the world, right? Um, and who are pretty much the same sort of of levels, <clears throat> so. That's a carbon fiber line cannot operate without a waste gas treatment system. It is yeah. so you have predominant gases and waste gas coming out from oxidation oven and LT. Is it also from HT and UHT as well? Uh, you get little. You get well. Ideally, you should get very, 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 very little out of the HT because most of it's come out in the LT. If you're getting any tars coming out in the HT, then you're not you're not processing correctly in the LT. Um, and it does happen. I've seen it happen uh, where somebody's got things wrong, to say the least. Mm. Um, so how the, do you get rid UHC, of the... Sorry, yeah. I was going to say, just from the UHC, I, I would anticipate nothing at all. Okay. How um, do you get rid of the TARS that is in the LT? Well, this is a, this is a problem. It, on, on, a, on an LT, is, just imagine this, it's a, a long tunnel, probably in the order of four, 15, even up to 20 metres long. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> with with open ends with uh, what we call uh, nitrogen seals on on the end of each and, end, the, and fifty percent and fifty percent of it's getting wasted. You know, you said precursor half of it gets wasted. Yes. So I, I'm assuming that's gases yeah. and tars. It's uh, it's all sorts. It's it, it's generally it come when it first comes off, uh, and it comes off in the second or third zone of that furnace, which is. Could be anywhere 400 degrees C, something like that. Okay. And um, this is where we place our exhaust ports. These these long tunnels have <clears throat> exhaust ports on either side, um, and you may have two, may have four. I've seen six. Uh, again, customer requests. Um, but the principle is, of course, is that <clears throat> that that cloud of gas that generates at that whatever particular temperature we're talking about. And, and of course, the line speed plays a part in this as well. Uh, and it generally comes off in around the third zone, second or third zone of the of this furnace. And what we it's, it's almost like a little black rain cloud, if you like. Um, and the principle is is when we're running these furnaces, and this is where the art plays a big part. We look down the furnace, which you can do, and it's not it's not it's not dangerous to your eyes at all. <clears throat> I would expect to see, I would like to be able to see to the end of the furnace, but not clear. If it's clear, clear as a bell, the atmosphere inside, it worries me because there's a possibility of air ingress. So we don't want air in because that damages not only the, uh, the fiber, but also damages the equipment as well. Right, you said so it's nitrogen to, inside. It's nitrogen inside. The so ideal atmosphere inside is, is like a hazy summer day. That's 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 a good atmosphere, but on occasion, if if your if your uh, balance of that furnace is incorrect, you'll find that that little black rain cloud does not want to go towards the waste the actual exhaust ports in this tunnel, and so you have to play. We have nitrogen uh, gauges on either end of the furnace. We have to play around with this to get the balance right, so that that little black rain cloud moves opposite to where the offtake is, to, to where the exhaust ports are. <clears throat> uh, 
And that's the way the balancing act comes in. Now, if we don't move that, we allow that little black ring cloud to sit where it is, which is usually towards the front of the of the uh, furnace. That that tar, that cloud, which is predominantly uh, uh, hydrocarbons and tars, begins to condense on the surface on the on the roof of the of the alloy muffle. And then what happens is that tar drips and drips onto the fibre, and we get what we call tar needles. And these tar needles are a very, very brittle uh, thing. And what can happen if that tar needle breaks, which it commonly does, it breaks the toe or breaks filaments on the toe, which, which really causes us problems in the furnace to get the, the fibre through. We, we can overcome that. But <clears throat> the principle being, we have to have this furnace balanced. And, and this is where the art comes in, and not least because like I said, in the old days, we had the incinerator right next to the LT furnace, and I could go and make adjustments there and see immediate the results inside the furnace. And that was a good way of, of working. Now, because all these things are remote, it's extremely difficult because you're relying on <clears throat> uh, valve automation. But a valve, if I make a change, a valve automation will, will open or close. Um, in some cases, it's not too bad, but predominantly um, it's I would prefer and I think most of us would prefer um, the control at the side of the furnace and usually simple manual control is, is the easiest um, but unfortunately because of the way waste gas treatment systems have gone they are remote they are PLC controlled <clears throat> and they're controlled well but as far as um, being an old-fashioned uh, um, uh, person doing this for, for many years, my preference is, is to have that um, that control at the furnace itself rather than through a PLC. But yeah. we have to live with these things, and they do work. They, they, they do work. Um, in fact, one particular company, a Japanese company, who builds furnaces have have what we call uh, what are commonly called now burn boxes, where the waste gas is is initially goes through a, a small incinerator, very, very small incinerator. And then that resultant burnt gases then go to the main DFTO. Um, and that's a way of controlling, it helps you to control your atmosphere in the furnace uh, mm -hmm. because it's, it's there right next to you and you can have some control over it. So these are the-, <clears throat> the And how do you get rid of those of, star needles? How do you get rid of those, remo how do you remove them? Uh, well, they, they, well, you don't, uh, you, um, there's nothing you can do about that because the instant you touch them, if you do touch them and they're still intact, they break. Um, or if they actually get down to the bobbin uh, in a uh, collection, um, as they are wound up onto the bobbin, they break. And you can see sometimes uh, uh, the broken filaments. <clears throat> and if you, you can feel that they are stiff with, with tar. Um, and that's, that's a ruin, the bobbin. Nobody wants that bobbin then. Um, okay. and, but it's, this is where the, the, you know, there are aspects of this line. Uh, everybody wants to automate the carbon fiber line, but it's extremely difficult to do that. Yeah, there are some aspects that are, can be automated, especially the uh, yeah. um, uh, packaging and such like. But there are, uh, the danger is, is that, yes, the, the best thing that we can ever get off a line is data. Um, so understanding, uh, changes and seeing where those changes occur is, is how we work with the line. The danger is, and, and what most, mo most engineers want to do, most uh, manufacturers want to do, is take that data and use it as a control loop. The unfortunate thing is, and, and this tension is one of the big things on a carbon fiber line, yeah. um, we, we purposely stretch and shrink both in the oxidation and in the carbonization, but it's under our control. We, we do that purposely to impart particular properties to the fiber. Um, but some companies um, have wanted to try and use that tension, that tension data to use it as a control loop. But the unfortunate thing is about this precursor that we're using is it's, it's, it's all tense purposes. It's a textile, it's modified acrylic. Um, it, in, in many degrees, it has a bit of a life of its own. Um, so it's one of these things that this is where your operators really 
earn their money. Um, they understand what's happening. When they can see something on another, they understand immediately what's going on. There might yeah. be a problem here. <clears throat> We're seeing something here, so there's something further back that's causing that. Let's go and sort that out. You, an automatic system can't do that. It can't think for itself, okay, we've got AI coming, but <clears throat> is it that good right. yet? Right. And, and, and this is where, um, whether, whether we like it or not, the manufacturing of carbon fiber is, is going to rely on human beings uh, just as much as the science of it. So it's the mixture of art and science still. Right. And there's no harm in trying to push more towards the science to get more control of things. We understand more about the process now than we ever did before. But there are certain, still certain aspects of, let's say, in an oxidation oven. You cannot see in an oxidation oven. You cannot look to see. Um, generally, they are a void. There's nothing inside, depending on the style of the oven, the, yeah. the way the air is moved and introduced into the oven. There are two or three different varieties. But that air basically lives, it's in a void, and a big void inside. You walk in and, uh, uh, quite easily. Um, <clears throat> and the trouble is you can't always see how that air is moving through that oven. When an oven is set up, it's set up empty, okay? So they do all their <clears throat> air flows, their temperature profiles empty. And that's, that's as far as the OEM will go. That's, that's it, there's my oven. I've proved that it's, it reaches these temperatures in these corners yeah. and that place and the airflow is linear and so on and so forth. Then we put fiber in and it all changes. The trouble is, of course, you can't get in while it's hot to measure it, to find out how it's behaving, what that airflow is doing, what the temperature profile is. So the next best thing is lots of thermocouples uh, strategically placed to give us an idea of what the flow, the not just the temperature profile is, but the flow, because of, of obviously the flow affects the temperature and temperature affects the flow. But the one thing we haven't yet worked out to do, uh, unless somebody's done it quietly, um, is is actually measuring that that flow uh, real time. Because what used to happen, me being the the greenhorn in the early days, <clears throat> they'd send me inside an oven with a handheld anemometer and turn the fans on with fiber inside. And I was told, right, stand here, stand there, stand there, hold it up, read what it says. And, you know, it's noisy and it is warm, even though the heating's not on. Um, and that's the only way you could get an idea. But again, once the temperature's on, your conditions change again. So it, it's still much of a guessing game. And this is where the art comes in. Right. This is where we use our our <clears throat> HMIs that are on the line that give us a screen of, of how we control things, the temperature, the fan speed, and so on and so forth. And that and being able to look at the fibre as it progresses through these ovens. And these ovens are big pieces of equipment, probably anywhere up to 12 metres tall, um, usually anywhere about, uh, I don't know, 18 metres long, hmm. uh, by about five metres five meters wide four or five meters wide they are big pieces of equipment right um and and when the fiber passes through these ovens certainly in the first oven and in the first zone and these usually you enter at the bottom and exit at the top uh, and they're usually a two two zone oven uh, so the first zone the lower zone zone one or bottom zone is where <clears throat> the fiber first hits the heat and this if, if you have a, a blemishes in your precursor this is where we see it um, because the toe collapses and causes no end of problems um, the fiber as it passes through this first zone changes color now this color is a very good indicator as to how our oxidation process is, is going um, <clears throat> and it goes from like a uh, from white to uh, yellow to amber to chestnut to brown, <clears throat> to finally black. And, and it's that change, and where that change occurs as it passes up the oven, gives us a good indication of how things right. are behaving. Interesting. Um, and it's, that's, we, we, so we use our, our control system that has those uh, control loops in it, that's what drives fan speed and temperature predominantly, but we also look at other stuff. And 
it's that and how that material is progressing through those ovens gives us a, a, a bigger picture as we can get from it. Now, um, understanding also what comes off in the oven uh, gives us a better idea of how, how things are progressing as well. And there, are, there has been this move towards uh, using FTIR, which is uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's how to read what those gases are in real time. So as they are generated and removed from the oven, you can get to read out as to what, what uh, uh, the, the waste gas is constituted of and how much of it. And this gives you a good idea of, of if that process is working well. The trouble right. is FTIR is, is extremely expensive um, and not many people uh, would consider it. But there, there certainly has been talk of, of moving towards that as a, a system for understanding what's going on in the oven. And, it, and this is the unfortunate thing. There's, there's been a lot of good research in, in laboratories and such like, um, and you get small pilot lines uh, uh, like you have in Deakin University in Australia or Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Um, but the unfortunate thing is these are tiny, small lines compared to a, a full-size carbon fiber line. And scale up from a lab to a full size, you have totally different uh, conditions. Um, so whilst the, the, there's good theory, good science coming out of some of the research, applying that to a full size line is not as easy as yeah. the researchers would have you think. So it, it's still very much down to experience uh, um, how these operators, uh, and these are, they're not, I've seen, I've seen lines populated with, uh, with uh, graduates, degree students, so, right. you know, MSCs or just got a, a bachelor's degree in some science subject. <clears throat> They're the worst people to put on a carbon fiber line. Totally the worst people. Yeah. So uh, before, because, uh, uh, actually, John, we only have another five, seven minutes remaining. Uh, I, okay. Let's let's go back to a little bit on converting as well. Uh, what you were talking yes, about. Yes, yes. So once we right. actually make carbon fibers, the next yeah. step goes. The, Yes, there's a number of routes. Um, uh, you can go to uh, uh, unidirectional prepay. That is simply uh, a number of toes are set up in a in a in a particular width, usually yeah. uh, six hundred or a meter or one and a half meters depends. <clears throat> Those toes then introduced onto a, what's called a prepay machine, where the the toes are put between two pieces of paper or paper and plastic. Resin introduced and it is pre impregnated with a, a standard resin, an epoxy resin. And again, there are many of them. Um, and that pre preg then is rolled up on a roll, <clears throat> sent to the customer. The customer will lay that out on a big table, cut out his shapes for his composite part, and make his, his composite by what's called layup. So taking those particular shapes, and these days they use um, a laser. To, to show where the shape should be. Yeah. You see that very much in the Formula One people. And <clears throat> then they make their composite part. The other route is um, predominantly to, towards the same end use, but it's uh, woven material. So it's put on a weaving machine and you get a fabric. Okay. Um, and of course, <clears throat> depending on the style of, of weaving, it gives you a particular type of, 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 of uh, material at the end of the day. And again, it's, it's then passed on to the the, the guy who's going to fabricate the part and they do what they do with it. There is another way um, uh, called what's called non-crimp fiber, which is a dry fiber buildup of, of a material, which again is then sent to the fabricator for them to make use of. And in this case, um, it's not pre-impregnated. There's no resin in it. The end user, uh, the fabricator puts their own resin system onto this. And they usually do that by uh, resin transfer molding. Um, you can also go towards pultrusion, which uh, I don't. I know that Vestas, one of the other uh, wind blade manufacturers, uses pultrusion for quite uh, pretty much all of their uh, turbine blades. Uh, and that is simply you're, you're taking your toes again, your carbon fiber, passing them through a die head to give a shape, right. uh, where resin is introduced, and it's just 
that is then just pulled out. And that gives you I, no, yeah, no I'm aware. Through. I'm aware of uh, this pultrusion technology being used in making a carbon fiber composite rod, uh, which is then yes. used in uh, which is then used in uh, cable electrical cable as a support. Yes, so yeah, yeah, They use yeah. carbon fiber yeah. and glass fiber together, and they pass it through. Uh, a die yeah. and create very very yeah. long uh, support rods. Yeah, and, and this and this is how they're uh, doing the oil and gas rises. Uh, you know these big rises that they have, they have that come out of the sea up to the rig itself from the wellhead, and and they're using carbon for that as well. And they're doing that that way. So that's that's one way. Um, less common is uh, chopped material, um, and that that uh, where they chop uh, usually six twelve millimeters, sometimes 25 millimeters. Um, and this can go into a number of end uses, uh, most predominantly um, injection molding, in, but in some cases into uh, non-wovens. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> SMC, uh, sheet molding compound, again, chop material, sprayed or dropped onto a paper and then resin infused on top. Um, and again, it's a, it's a cheaper form of, of producing a uh, composite part. Um, there's BMC, bulk molding compound, which is just what's in, in its most, most crudest form is a, a barrel of resin, pour yeah. your carbon fiber in and stir it, bulk molding compound. Um, <clears throat> and there's there are quite a few different ways. Of course, now there's, there's 3D. Um, uh, right, right. I think the, there uh, is there's a company called Mark Forge who's making 3D printers where you can use carbon filament yes. to make. Yeah, uh, that's 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 been used quite a lot now. Very interesting. Um, so yeah. there's the, the, the many different routes to the uh, to end use, um, right. and, and people come up with new new ones all the time. So um, it's always it's always interesting to see what what's uh, being presented in the in the uh, periodicals to see who's been playing around with things. Some brilliant. Some work. Some get into production. Some don't. Good. It was a very, very good conversation, John. Uh, I think I asked you for a limited number of minutes, but I think we ex extended it quite a bit, but I didn't want to stop okay. you. It was very, very interesting. Thank you so much, John, okay. for your time. Uh, really, really relevant conversation. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank okay. you. I appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thanks. Take Thanks. care. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.